Railways have been around for a long time. Naturally, in times of war, attempts have been made to weaponize railways, and nothing was more effective on a railway than simply bolting a heavy cannon that would be otherwise impractical to move around to a flatbed and using the railway to push it about. Over time, these cannons got bigger, until eventually full-on naval-grade cannons were being mounted for use on railways. While effective for destroying long-range targets, their accuracy was often limited by the direction of the track, and they were very cumbersome to move around, often requiring tracks to be specially laid in order for them to hit a target. Despite this, the ability to move such a powerful weapon was worth the trouble it took to prepare it. That brings me on to the subject of today's little factoid. In 1934, the German Army High Command wanted a weapon that could destroy the defences in place at the Marino Line, France's main line of defence from Germany. They wanted the gun to be able to fire shells powerful enough to penetrate metres of thick reinforced concrete while far enough away from the front lines to be out of the range of French artillery. Krupp of Essen, one of Germany's most prolific engineering companies, was set with the task of designing and building the weapon. Engineer Erich Müller calculated the gun would have to fire a shell roughly 80 centimeters in diameter and nearly 7 tons in weight. As the company had other projects to attend to, the weapon was somewhat put on a back burner until 1936, when, during a visit to the works, Adolf Hitler inquired about how feasible such a weapon would be. No definite answer was given, but the Inquisition did lead to the project taking up a priority spot in the company. By early 1937, the designs for the gun were finalised and construction of the weapon was set into motion. In order to fire the desired shells, the main barrel of the gun needed to be 32.5 metres long, with an equally large frame to mount the gun onto. Due to the complexity of fabricating a single barrel of such a size, the actual cannon part of the weapon wouldn't be completed until 1940. In the meantime, a test model was built in 1939 and trialled at the Hillersleben Proving Grounds. There, it managed to fire a 7-ton shell through 7 metres of concrete and 1 metre of solid armour plating. Pleased with the results, two of these cannons were ordered by German High Command. Once the first gun was completed in 1941, it was properly trialled in Ruzhen Valade, now Darlowo, Poland, where the gun was found to have an effective range of 39 kilometers, with a maximum range of 47. To put that into perspective, it could have easily hit the cliffs of Dover, or even a target halfway to London from Calais in France. Once the trial was deemed successful, the cannon and its newly fabricated chassis were packed up and shipped off to battle in 1942, having been given the name Schwerer Gustav, or Heavy Gustav, named after the senior director of the firm, Gustav Krupp. As France was already under German occupation, the gun was sent east towards Russia to aid on the Eastern Front. The gun arrived in Crimea to aid the German forces during the siege of Sevastopol. Before the gun could be assembled and fired, however, the German forces had to lay down a short section of railway line connected to the main line they were using to transport Gustav. This not only included the rails Gustav would be sat on, but also additional rails for the cranes required to assemble the gun to rest on too. It took 4,000 men five weeks to lay down the rails, assemble the gun, and get it into firing position, requiring a crew of 500 men alone to operate and fire it. Once assembled, the world was introduced to the force of nature that was Schwerer Gustav. The entire construction had a total length of 47.3 meters, a height of 11.6 meters, and weighed a total of 1,350 metric tons. To put that into perspective, here is a human being, here is the Flying Scotsman, here is a Union Pacific Big Boy, and here is Gustav. These were the shells it was firing, which weighed 7 metric tons each. The average male African bush elephant weighs 6 metric tons. Long story short, this thing was a mobile building that had the power to fire an earth-shattering payload as heavy as an elephant over 40 kilometers away with relatively sharp accuracy. It was truly a force to be feared. The siege had been going on for months at this point, with Soviet forces managing to hold control over the city thanks to the many underground bunkers and fortifications they had. 
Conventional assaults as well as aerial and naval bombardments proved to be ineffective against the reinforced bunkers and forts, and so it was up to Gustav to destroy these fortifications, something it was more than equipped to do. The gun was used from the 5th to the 17th of June, firing a total of 47 rounds. By the 4th of July, the siege was over, and Sevastopol was practically razed to the ground, with most bunkers, underground or overground, effectively destroyed. The Gustav was then dismantled and moved on to the Eastern Front, being assembled roughly 30 kilometers away from Leningrad, ready to be used to help storm the city. Despite the gun being good to go, the attack was cancelled, and the gun remained there until early 1943. Meanwhile, the second cannon, named Dora after the senior your engineer's wife, was positioned outside Stalingrad in August of 1942 and fully assembled by September, also positioned with the intention of aiding in an assault on the city. Back in Germany, the development of another railway gun was well underway. Known as the Lange Gustav, this gun would have had a longer barrel than the Gustav and fired a narrower caliber of shell intended for longer distance giving it an effective range of 190 kilometers. In a poor turn of fate for the Germans, the cannon was severely damaged during construction thanks to several bombing raids made by the RAF. At this point, it isn't entirely known what happened to either of the cannons, as neither of them were used again in combat. After the assault on Leningrad was called off and the harsh winter of 1942-43, it was likely that Allied forces were able to retaliate and push the German armies back. By this point, the war was turning against the Germans, and as such, both the Gustav and Dora were dismantled and moved back towards Germany. Because of how long it would take to set either of them up, Gustav or Dora couldn't be set up in time to act as a defense against the advancing Allied forces, and even if they could, they were built to destroy bunkers, not small, mobile targets like advancing convoys or aircraft. On the 14th of April 1945, the Gustav was destroyed to prevent it from being captured by the approaching US troops, with its remains being found eight days later by said US troops in a forest roughly a few kilometers away from Zwickau. Dora was blown up shortly afterwards on the 19th, also to prevent it from being captured. Debris from both guns was taken and studied by Soviet engineers, but little useful information was gained from it. As large and impractical as they were, Gustav and Dora were both frighteningly powerful weapons that luckily never got to fully show off what they were capable of. I remind you, these things could easily pierce a 7 meter thick reinforced barrier from 39 kilometers away. Overall, while it wasn't the only terrifyingly powerful weapon the Germans were packing, we can be thankful they were at least underutilized. Because to be able to annihilate a target from so far away much better than the Air Force could, well, let's just say that it's certainly a frightening example of German engineering at its most brutal. Subscribe for more.